All right, guys, it is time for the final panel of the day. I'm going to do a little bit of stretching here. All the folks out in the Ustream land, you guys should get up and stretch. <laughs> All righty. Uh, can we have the sound back on for you stream now? Yep. All right, it's on. Cool. Excellent. By the way, I would thank um, no Pyrox37. I didn't want to know that you were naked. Did not want to know that. <laughs> Well, I mean, if he's going to share it with the entire internet to see, I'm going to share it with this whole room to see, too. So. It just means he's bad at constant breach. Keep for team. <laughs> All right, guys. We're missing a couple of panelists. So, if they went to the bathroom, we're probably in the line. They went to the bathroom? Okay. All righty. So, taking suggestions for karaoke songs for tonight. Any? Or whoever, whomever. You gotta get Yolo to sing Careless Whisper. Sing what? Careless Whisper. Careless Whisper. Careless Whisper. Come on, you're gonna get a girl song. I think we can get Arbiter Hop to sing like some some Boy George or something. Dr. <laughs> said, what year was uh, that? Before you, were before you were born. Okay. <laughs> I I yes, yes, Sean. You're there too. I think your age is combined. <laughs> no, they do. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that's absurd. Huh? Uh, maybe that, yeah. It depends on what they have. <laughs> Actually, my just, just gotten over that cough that I had for a long time, so I yeah, foolishly smoked a cigar last night. Pretty good. But I woke up this morning with that that taste. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember. What was the cigar? It was a torpedo. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness no, that's illegal. It's illegal to bring them in. Yeah. That was a, uh, I think it was actually Mexican. A Mexican rapper, Dominican Seed, under and grown, something like that. I can't remember. I, I very rarely get to smoke cigars though. So. Way down. <laughs> Why, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, where there's. Do we have a name plaque here for Alyssa? Alrighty. Uh, oh, she has one. That's Addison's. Oh, no, there it is. Okay. It's like a lot of rainy. Is that what that says? It is a lot of rainy. Making her red name debut. <laughs> so, Alyssa, while we're waiting for the last person to come, no? while we're waiting for the last panelist, do you want to tell the folks that out there in TV land what you do? Sure, so I am the producer on the content team. I report to Melissa, I help Rob kind of her right hand. I also, um, in short, what my job is, I just nag people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Especially <laughs> kind of daily or hourly. You know, what are you doing? When's you going to be done? That kind of thing. Not when the answer is always, stop bugging me. <laughs> Alrighty. Did someone pretend to be say something? Yeah, I can try to pretend to be. What? I can try to pretend to be. See if it's here, John. I know, not like this, though. Not when he's not as that. impressions of everyone in the office, <laughs> except for me, apparently. Well, I told you I'd save yours for, for your last day. For my last day. <laughs> well, we all know what the most famous impersonation that Michonne does is, right? What is it? Uh, Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry, what's the deal? No. <laughs> what's the deal with impressions, Abby? What's the deal with that one? His <laughs> No, what, what, what about uh, Bat Neon? Bat Neon? Oh, Bat Neon. I thought it was your impression of you is pretty good, too. He has a impression of you? Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. I mean, I, I, mean, I know you thought I already was with the hat. Yeah, all he has to do is with the hat. <laughs> 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 
but I really that low hanging fruit. Well, it's just mainly tangents. Like, yeah. right, it's like yeah. right now, like right now, like right now, like right now, Matt has like nice glasses, right? Yeah. right? I like Matt's glasses a lot. Where are these glasses? glasses? I got them at the yeah. obstetrician in Foster City. Bro, I was in Foster City the other day. I was going to, you know what I like is Target. It's okay, that Target's okay. You think so? Yeah. The, uh, the one in, uh, John's here. Sam Ramon is oh, okay. John's here. Thanks a lot. Outstanding. Nice job. Outstanding. Sounds legit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Yay, Hector's here. Woo! Can it make them out occasionally? Uh, uh, speaking of TMI. <laughs> I wouldn't be here if it didn't. <laughs> uh, oh. Speaking about the final panel of the day. <laughs> End this now. <laughs> Finish him. All right, folks, here we go. Uh, so I'm actually going to turn the mic over to whoever the hell is driving this this thing. We should have practiced this one. One, two, three, not in. Not in. All right, so I'm right, to. Hey, welcome to the story, lore, and endgame panel. So this is the panel. As well as anything to do with Endgame. Uh, to talk about more, we have uh, Sean, Dr. Aeon McCann, and John Purdy and Hegner. And I'll throw in my little bits whenever I can. To talk about Endgame stuff, we have Jeff Arbor Hawk Hamilton. Okay. We had a very similar panel to this one last year, my sand game. Uh, but we asked, we basically wanted you to know the storylines, the ideas that you guys had that uh, you wanted us to deal with. And uh, we found it rather amusing because as we're writing all this stuff down, it was like, yeah, we're working on that already. We've got plans for this. It's like every, you know, so yeah, you, you want to know, you know, how does Bryce, how does Reckon feel about this PowerPoint. <laughs> you also asked us, what has Derek Wade been up to? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, what the hay is going on with Kate Douglas? <laughs> big story ideas in the works already, um, and we kind of uh, would like to hear from you uh, specifically on what your thoughts and ideas and kind of what you want out of the storylines that have been hinted at uh, is going to be. So we're going to have people come up to the microphone and kind of give us their sort of, this is how I want to interact with this storyline, and that storyline is the town. Oh, yeah. So we are very curious, after dropping hints for 23-ish, or 13 issues, uh, exactly what you guys uh, think Battalion is, what you think the story is going to be, where you want it to go, uh, and basically how you want your characters to interact with it. So, uh, because we have our own plans, but uh, we also want to make sure that your needs are getting addressed with our Earth go so, boom. Earth go boom. So there's a microphone over there. Also, please. Uh, okay. If you, if you guys don't want to fight Italian, just say we don't want to fight Italian. So that will help us as well. I think I should sum up my thoughts. So, oh, uh, well, the first question was, who the hell is Battalion? Uh, Battalion is better known as the Coming Storm. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, so, uh, the coming storm was into that, uh, starting with uh, Ouroboros, or maybe even earlier, um, as uh, you know, something that uh, is destined to destroy the Earth and everything on it. Sorry for interrupting. Um, I think I can sum up my ideas about Battalion in a way that Zulundra would understand. I'm not saying endgame content, but aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I'll make that right now. <laughs> I'm Mechanos from the Justice Server, and I would, I would figure that the battalion um, is, it has been built up to be an extremely dangerous race. Um, we've dealt with alien threats before, but this one is known for actually consuming the wells 
of other species, meaning they basically have the, the, the composite knowledge and skills of a thousand, possibly a thousand different species. Yeah. Okay. Uh, assuming for the probably his sudden truth. So, I guess um, I, I would imagine that um, there wouldn't be anything less than in incorrect content, to be honest. That is not necessarily true, sir. Really? Yeah. So, so they would have lower level? Um, I mean, every, every, every army has their shock troops, so. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Except for this one. <laughs> 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 As a bit of a lore junkie myself, what I expect out of Italian, at least thematically, is I want something that is completely inhuman in appearance, in action. I mean, the sad, sadly, the only thing that I can think of, of like sci-fi reference, would be something like the Daleks. Not that I want anything like that, but something that you look at that, and that is not human. That does not act as a human does. You know, I could also see it as literally a composite of different races that have been absorbed, a la the Borg sort of thing, or that whatever weird species that kind of has great tea heads that eat Borg or whatever that Thank you. I've always thought of the coming storm as something along the lines of Praetorian Hammy finally takes over the rest of Praetoria, gets in touch with Earth Hammy, they mutate together, they get along uh, more or less with the Coralex and the uh, Shivans. Uh, at the same time, Laru comes and eats the primal Earth universe. However, Mender Silos gets in touch with himself back when he was just a DJ. And all their characters are able to escape to a new universe where they have fingers and facial expressions. <laughs> I'm not sure it is serious. <laughs> I'm on board. Can <laughs> I have to follow that? <laughs> um, mine is, the, it's part a question about the battalion itself, but if Blanco fights Arachnos and Vanguard fights Ricky, um, who fights these guys? You do. Uh, you do. You do. So, but do we have to get, do we have to get stomped into the floor first for an issue or three before the appropriate group is founded? Because Vanguard didn't exist before the Rigby showed up, and it took, you know, are we actually going to hit, like, the edge of despair before we fight back, or are they just going to show up and we're going to go, hey, Spike, and I I think one of those makes a better story than the other, so we'll go with the better story. <laughs> and that would be Spike. So uh, we have a suggestion from Ustream, and they're saying that, uh, uh, from actually from Golden Girls, stating that, uh, like, that something, um, uh, and there's no winky. Uh, <laughs> something, uh, Golden Girl is saying, uh, with uh, something with uh, the battalion, something biomechanical would be, would be cool. Cool. Sorry, that's it. Plushy Megumi would like to know, since the they use Keldians, the, uh, again, Father Sun's arc is he's the last one, they use Keldians as fuel for their ships and whatnot. Um, I suppose what I expect out of the battalion would be they make use of that energy after a fashion that they'd be uh, adaptive. I don't know if it would be a nova form or a lobster form or what have you, but enemies that would change based on team makeup to make it more difficult. Okay. We don't want to tanker on our team because we can't beat the time. <laughs> Something I've always wanted in City Heroes was really, really, really Galactus sized giant monsters. I was always hoping Battalion was Galactus and he was going to come eat the planet. We'd have to fight him back. Actual Galactus? No, that's, that's absolutely not. He's much more fashionable. Battalion dresses much better than Galactus. <laughs> We have a better costume creator. So, but um, something you talk about interacting with this is something that you had in Praetorian going rogue, but I haven't seen any other content, is the choosing side, side switching. You can go from loyalist to resistance and back, and you pick a side. 
So I don't know how to tie into battalion, but I'd like to see more of side picking to be able to say, okay, I want to side with them against the battalion as opposed to these guys. Another uh, another suggestion from Ustream from Chad Golzell, man, actually. Uh, he says, the only thing, uh, the main thing I want out of the battalion endgame is to fight them in space. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to which, which might lead to my own very similar suggestion um, for battlefield for this. How about near orbit? Yes. We like space. Sean proved that we could pull off space. Yeah, I would, infinity. I would like the coming storm to be such a world-shattering event that in every zone, the moon rises in the east and sets in the west. That would be different. It would be different, yeah. Yes, we are moon is screwed up. <laughs> well, that one kind of goes through 2012. Just destroy it. Moon is flipping upside down or something. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not what I'm here for. Um, <laughs> I was thinking I would like to see something so world shattering that it actually changes the world. Like with the last story arc. Spoiler: Statesman dies. He's gone by issue 23. And it's impacted the world in a way that everything seems to be changing. People are taking on different roles and um, like all sorts of things like that. I'd like to see something more. So I think we talked about it last player summit with Admiral Sutter's and Skyway City being destroyed. And there were reasons why that couldn't be done, but I'd like to see something just catastrophic happen. I mean, it's a battalion, last battalion, whatever. And yeah. So we should have had the zone revamp one after this. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't take, I mean, we just turn Paris into a crater. Well, so I, I guess uh, the question going off that is, uh, like, would you guys be satisfied with something where it's like, if something like that happened, you would change it wouldn't seem for an issue, right? Like with statesmen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you have immediate change, then we have to do all this sort of phasing stuff uh, so that when you start your storyline, everything's hunky dory, and then halfway through the storyline, stuff changes. Uh, and as you know, we've noted uh, phasing and better styles don't play well together. Yeah, and um, also you can't phase ge geometry. And you can't phase geo. So, uh, so lagging by an issue is kind of our cheat in uh, being able for you to actually show the world. I mean, we can have the like an IOM of the change, but not actually have the actual zone change happen for an issue. So. I have a different take on battalion. Uh, wanting to tie it into the whole, like, you know, just explosion of the carnates, is that battalion is actually backed by another well, not the well of heroes, possibly the well of order or the well of darkness. And you're not just coming at a bunch of aliens that are going to destroy the earth. They're incarnate aliens from another well. <laughs> and even worse is that they know that Ham is very powerful on Victoria. Let's make it incarnate. That would be something that would scare the well of the Furies into making a whole bunch of incarnates that need to defend, you know, basically if you're going to destroy the well as well as everything else. So that to me was kind of the earth shattering aspect of it. You're not just talking about destroying the earth, you're talking about destroying this cosmic power which goes throughout the universe as well. I think you're thinking around, around the, the right power level. <laughs> we've been discussing, so, cool. <laughs> so related to what Plush Megumi said, uh, I was thinking voids should be involved. Like the void hunters? Void hunters, void seekers, all so of that stuff. So what kind of story would you like to see about them? Because I don't think, there's there's a couple stories in the game that deal with them, including one technician, I think, but there's not that much. Some, some expansion of them. And they strike me as possibly being tied into either as mercenaries that work with battalion or possibly with soldiers. So an interesting, and this is a question that I kind of caught up in my mind, was like, okay, well, if we have the idea that uh, Keldians are used as fuel, fuel, what are Nictus used for, right? Since they're very, they're closely related in some aspects, like, would the Nictus even be against battalion? Would it be for battalion? Like, but they're I just, they're used as brake pads. <laughs> 
That was what we decided on. Right now. Um, okay. But yeah, it's it's a really cool idea. I think. I was wondering if instead of something that was so big and flashy and just just you know just oh my gosh what's going on? What if something far more sinister and subtle? What if you know oh the heroes and the incarnates are all saying you know well well they're the enemy. They're the enemy. What if they come in posing sort of as the saviors? What if you get to, what if their biggest threat is the fact that they sort of get you to choose to side with them? What if you can actually play for an Italian for a few missions and sort of see things from that point of view? Kind of how you had people who were, you know, in the beginning with going rogue, you know, the loyalists are going to be the villains and then the resistance are going to be the heroes and the people are like, well, what if I believe in Emperor Cole's rule? What if you're a member of a battalion who sees what's really going on and you decide to side with the primals? Or conversely, someone maybe like the Luddites who see them as, you know, saviors coming down to wipe out all of this technology and all these horrible, horrible things that are going on on this planet. Yeah, John, you can sort of indoctrinate you. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. As you sort of indoctrination mechanic. Or, yeah, so you're talking like the uh, visitors? Yes, of, very much so. Hey, we're here, and we're not here to kill you. We're here to make your life better. And everyone's like, hey. Except for Vanguard, who's like, no, and they start shooting. Making the heroes and villains. And it's like, oh, would you get the power of the threat? We're not the threat of these guys. Why do they need all this power sort of thing? That's cool. <clears throat> the phrase world shattering keeps getting thrown about. We, we have a shattered world already. We have the shadow shards. So what if that's uh, another goal here? What if Battalion decides to shatter our world and we need to go find another one? That's a great, great lead in for City of Heroes 2. <laughs> 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 But this is where I keep all my stuff. <laughs> Instead of going ahead and doing this as a giant Bigfoot to begin with, where it's like it's this big shock and awe thing to start with, what if instead we have a smaller reveal? Because we already know that Shivans are like the shock troops, the, the, the initial wave. Who are the spies? Who are the collaborators? Who are the people that you didn't know? We're here laying the groundwork, finding out where the fault lines of power are. Who are the advanced hidden group watching Primal Earth on behalf of Battalion? That's an interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you think. We can tell you, but then we have to kill of everyone course. in this room. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't expect an answer from you. Apparently, my ties are being served. That's a very interesting way of thinking. Yeah. I, I think, though, with that, the one thing is just for us and for you know, being careful that there is actually authority figures you can trust, right? Because we don't want it to turn into the city of anti authority. Uh, <laughs> I was you don't want to go What is a group of an NPC group in the world? No. You know, whether it is Praetorian, Primal, Villain, Hero, it doesn't really matter too much. But one of those groups is actually working with Battalion behind the scenes. If we were to do something like that, it would have to be something we laid the groundwork for. For many issues, maybe so many, many, many like laying subtle hints here. Like we would have had to have started already. Yeah. Counter spray is going to take a long time. We're going to be hearing everything all over again now. So, you guys, you are about halfway through, and I thought that you had another question. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. So. Uh, the next question we have, uh, many people already went here already uh, with their, what do you expect out of Italian, um, but uh, obviously, uh, you know, Italian's not the end all be all of everything, well, maybe not. Um, but uh, one question that we, uh, we're always curious, uh, you know, uh, so to kind of set this up, with this and the next question, is, uh, you know, for those who play paper and pencil role playing games, the game master, wants to know what their players' ambitions are and their goals and what they want out of the game. This is kind of our... So we can crush those goals, yes. Uh, so, we, uh, so, uh, so we can cater the game to them. So we, you know, we really want to take this advantage of this summit here, Player Summit, uh, to kind of find out what your player goals are. And uh, so one of the questions we had was, what makes you feel epic? What 
makes you feel badass? What makes you feel, you know, world-shattering, you know, destructive? And, uh, you know, what sort of epic storylines do you want to see uh, us tackle in the future? Because we want you to feel epic. That is, you know, a driving factor of, of City of Heroes. You know, it's kind of, you know, it is cool, you know, fighting the gangs and, and stopping the, and the drug wars, and we will always write stories around that for the players who want that sort of thing. But we also know the players want to be epic and they want, you know, awesomeness thrown at them. So while people are thinking that, I'll go ahead and throw out a couple of things that people are saying in Ustream right now. Um, one of the first ones that popped up was actually saving lives. It makes people feel epic. Um, and saving tons of people. Uh, Tredane says that firing off judgment makes them feel up. <laughs> well done, awkward. Um, Pyrox is uh, hearkening back to an earlier day, but hurting a whole map into one dumpster and burning them down. And you know, uh, basically saving the world from anything evil. That doesn't work for villains. Or ruining the world and crushing them beneath your boot. <laughs> Go right ahead. Ultimately, uh, ultimately if, I, if I want to feel epic, I want to feel like the world has changed in some unique way from my actions. Now, for a general MMO, this is going to be real difficult. But, you know, that that's the thing, is... Uh, is you know, I don't want to be a generic villain. I want to put my stamp on the world at least. I mean, you already have this in the game in the sense where you say, you know, you are now seeing the world through this person's actions. And, you know, can we, like, do something with that whereby the world is somehow visually different? I don't know. It was just a, it was just a thought that came off my head because I came up here to answer a different question. So, <laughs> that's okay. Hi, I'm uh, Waka Latte from Virtue. Um, may I address the other battalion question along with this one? Too? Yes. Okay. Um, in regards to the battalion, I was thinking, um, we're all aware of the coming storm. We all seem to think that it's some great giant, gigantic entity or massive entities that we're going to fight. But what if it's a little more philosophical and the coming storm is more like an implication of everybody is battling for power and it's not power when power is not determined is good or bad based on just power itself, but rather the people who use it. And with all of the heroes and the villains fighting and clamoring for power, could it be said that the corruption of power over time, the need to possess it, is what is bringing about whatever this coming storm could be? That's really interesting. That's a good point. And that was kind of the thing we were going for with the Mediterranean arc, of like grabbing power immediately corrupted you, but trying to, but still, I mean, it's interesting to think like, okay, well, once you get a taste of it, you think, oh, I need so much more power than this. Exactly. <laughs> um, in terms of the epic feeling, I want to agree with the guy who was just before me. Um, the ability to, uh, in personal opinion, to diplomatically, as best as we can, with as few deaths, I suppose. Um, make some kind of imprint on the world or have the ability to sway the hearts of the masses whether for ill intent or for more righteous intent because I would think that it's not necessarily the action you're taking but the motivation behind your words that can persuade other people to take the action for you okay that's good Thank you very much. Okay, so we can assume that the events are not actually going to destroy the entire world in the game, but the people, especially the uh, civilians in the world, aren't going to know that. So some of them are probably going to simply try to leave. Uh, Portal Corporation might be a possibility for that. They've got some nearby world that they can get to and essentially burn the bridge behind them. Uh, maybe something happens where some part of Peregrine Island essentially gets surrounded and they decide that they're just going to evacuate themselves and as much of the city as they can get out. And the hero's job would be to essentially ensure that they've got enough time to do that 
and then destroy the portals and maybe the entire structure so that nothing can follow them. And on the villain side, maybe there's some other villain group that has the same idea, and as a villain, you can help them, but at the same time, make sure that you're there to fill the vacuum after they leave. Maybe something where you arrange that um, anybody who's left is essentially going to follow you because you got the people leaving to say, okay, now this guy's in charge. So you, you as a villain, you go first. Well, no, because the advanced scouts so you're 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 hurting. Hurting. Well, the idea is that you think that <coughs> the battalion is going to be defeated, but you convince the villain group that uh, they need to leave because they're going to lose because uh, the earth's going to be destroyed. You convince them to leave, and then you get to play with all their stuff. <laughs> um, back to the, the Italian thing again, but one of the things that is made, I've been suspicious of, possibly just because it doesn't make any sense, are the whole is the whole metaporter thing. I mean, they're setting up not to metaport civilians or anything, just heroes and villains and thugs and street people and. Are you sure there's, that you actually end up the same on the other end of the metaporter? What if they're funneling out some of the people and replacing them with... Cylons. No, no. Yeah. With Victoria, there are actually copies of you on other worlds that can be convinced to play your part, and they look just like you and have your genetic material. Yeah, so that could be a really interesting thing that Battalion might be setting up, is are you really yourself, can you really trust somebody that you actually, that actually might not be who they say they are the way you think they were? And as far as Epic goes, Praetorium was so cool because you could actually go and change things like by siding with one or the other, um, for example, People would disappear, and you'd never see them again during that during your entire time in Pretoria, because by your actions um, you eliminated them, and they actually went away. And I think that's really epic. Okay, that's imprinting the world. <laughs> so one of the most epic things to me that has ever happened in this game was Hero One and his crew going to take the fight to the Brick Deep in their home world. Now that you have him back. I think it would be great that all these incarnates go and, well, try again and succeed. <laughs> so, my name is Polly and I am a red cider, and what makes me feel epic is killing lots and lots of people, especially innocent people. <laughs> to run through DA and then make a choice. I don't care about the badge. No, I just want to kill both of y'all. I don't need two minutes to kill everybody else. I just want to kill you two. Security, security is waiting for you. <laughs> I play City of Heroes because in my day-to-day -day life, I can be a perfectly nice, acceptable person and people find me friendly and lovely and what have you, and I get accolades for that in the real world. In the real world, if I rob a bank, I get in trouble, and that's very sad. <laughs> So what you do it poorly. <laughs> I'm hoping to learn something from the Super Blockbuster. But what makes me feel epic in the game is doing things that I cannot do in the real world, and that usually involves maiming, killing, and stealing. <laughs> I would like to uh, point out that it's the permanence of your impact on the world, such, for instance, uh, this started with uh, Rick, uh, <coughs> Recluse's victory, where your side or another, some section of that future, transformed to your vision. I like Pollyanna's point, they disappear. Uh, if you maim somebody, I want them to stay maimed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, as a hero, uh, that is along the lines of, I save somebody, and then they come back and help me. Or, uh, they now show up in my world. As a villain, uh, I look for something very different. I want to be able to be like the iconic villains in the game. 
I don't want to be one of Recluse's lieutenants. I want my own island nation. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> A couple of times on feeling epic, uh, although it kind of distills down to the same aspect, uh, joining the multiple team dropship raid and taking out all the dropships in the zone before one of them had a chance to escape. Uh, the massive influx of, of Victorian armor in the middle of Atlas Park and defending the statue of Atlas and taking them down uh, a pitched battle against impossible odds and somehow prevailing. You know, we're not supposed to be able to take out a dropship. Uh, as yeah. a group of heroes, we're not supposed to take out the entire Praetorian army. Dropships were the very first thing in the game. Somebody told me it's impossible to kill. But it was a team cooperative event. Yeah. It, was, it was something that shouldn't have been done. I mean, to, to uh, connect that to an earlier statement, uh, if you've got an invasion going on, perhaps we're going to use one of Portal's uh, portals to evacuate a major section of the city. We've got battalion and all their armaments coming over the horizon, and the heroes are the last ragged line of defense. Your civilian population is fleeing behind you, and if you don't hold the line, then they will overrun all of those innocent civilians and pour through that portal and wreak havoc on the other side. This is your defense, and if you don't do it, your city dies behind you. Now, if you can stand up to that, you feel pretty epic. Cool. I feel like you kind of stole my thunder there, because that was pretty much what my point was going to be as well. Um, I, I thought that being epic in some way is doing the impossible. Basically defeating the undefeatable, saving those that are unable to be saved. For instance, the, the Dark Historia arcs. Um, you can save Sigil and Cadaver Kill, even though you're fighting almost uh, an overwhelming force of Talon's of Vengeance. And eventually, um, in Dark Historia, you can defeat a god that is, is now able to consume entire cities. So I, 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 and then eventually I lead, you know, you, you lead an entire team in, um, to, to defeat a god. I thought that was pretty epic myself. No one, you know, no one else thought, you, you know, there's this whole feeling of hopelessness throughout the arc, but you, you, you never stop. You, you defeat the god. So I have a question for you about that. Yes. Uh, to what extent does the epicness come from the framing of the action? Like, how it's set up versus the mechanics of what you have to actually do. <coughs> like, that dropship fight that was described is supposed to be, like, mechanically impossible, right? So, and the story arcs were never intended to be mechanically impossible, though, you know, maybe mechanically difficult to save, you know, two, two bosses against eight talents bosses or whatever that spawn is. That's actually a pretty good question. <laughs> I, I, I figure that it, it's actually, um, it, it can kind of depend, really. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Dark Story arcs you know, are entirely possible, but they still, the framing of it did, did make it feel like you were going up against something that could not be defeated, but you were going to try it anyway. But I will, I will say that um, the, the, something that was actually intended to be defeating, you know, impossible, that you pull up anyway. You know, like the game advice is still pretty awesome. awesome. So Andy, I just noticed that half the team just came in with drinks. They better be getting our drinks. That's all I mean. Could somebody please take the panel's drink order? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just real fast, I just uh, the the. Uh, I really wanted to do more than like the future with Sigil and Cadaver Kill. That was kind of a huge experiment, and I wasn't sure if people were going to hate it or, or love it or demand I was fired. But um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'm really happy to hear it. You know, people like it a lot, and you know, like I think people have said like the chance to be a full like a full hearty hero, and so you know, I think it's a, good, a cool thing that we can do more in the future. I did like that part of the dark of the Heather's arc. That you have a cho you have a choice as to what you do, so you can attack. Your choice has some sort of 
permanent or impact this. I think everyone really likes it. Yeah, I don't think anyone demands you get fired over that. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of other reasons to fire people. Took a soul's That is the straw that broke the camel. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I, I really like to see some sort of permanence of my act, of any actions or consequence of what you decide to do in the game. That that makes, that makes it feel epic, like you had you put your stamp on your stamp on the game. So <laughs> another quick question about that. Sorry. Uh, if you could choose between your actions being permanent and story arcs being replayable in Ouroboros, which would you choose? Oh, you mean one shot? Yes. Yeah, I like it. One shot's better. Well, okay, so <laughs> what, can I see a show of hands? If you'd rather have content in Ouroboros, raise your hand. If you'd rather have contacts permanently die forever, raise your hand. So, so it's kind of an all or nothing thing. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but like if you were to put, you know, three of five story arcs in a zone in Ouroboros, but not the other two, like the zone wouldn't make much sense if you tried to replay it in flashback, right? So, it, yeah, it, it's a difficult choice. I just wanted to, like, if everyone overwhelmingly said, hey, kill all my contacts, I don't care, that'd be something else. But yeah. there wasn't that, so. Well, you do, I, you, I, you do like to see, you do like to see what your actions have some sort of impact. But yeah. But Matthew's asking, you, yeah, if you go and you do the rough art, you can save the life, and you see them both there, and that's part of it. Yeah. Actually. Yeah, you, you like to see that. That's what I like to see. I think that makes, makes people feel, like, oh, I did, hey, I did that. Sure. Okay. So, um, something else that makes Plushy Meg feel really epic. It's one thing that we're introduced to dark, the Dark God Mont, and we were told it's impossible, but we do it in the span of several arcs. I would think something more along the lines of Nemesis, something that we have been told with so many times, so many arcs on so many different planets, and for my character to, through fighting, through dialogue, through a combination of two, through fighting other things, to be able to have Nemesis stop in front of me and say, you're right, I'm sorry. <laughs> that is <would> be epic. <laughs> so, uh, Lord Nemesis has kind of become a little bit of a joke. Everything's a Nemesis plot. And uh, so we've kind of cooled the Jets on using him at all for anything. So, it's all Tuesday. Yeah. 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 It's, all Tuesday. it's a Nemesis plot. Oh. <laughs> yes. I mean, that, he, was, he had to come out of retirement or something, so we gave him that. So. Or Darren Way, or Reckless, or any big villain. Darren Way's not a big villain. He's a big one. 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 He's a tall. He's not big. That makes me feel that I had a few things come to mind. One of the first things is uh, I built my blaster. I've had him since issue four. He's an ice energy, and I love use going back to Adams Park and using my energy secondary. <laughs> to punch Ethelian out of the draw distance. <laughs> I stopped that for knockback just for that reason. That just makes you cruel. <laughs> so heroic. Um, like the amount of damage probably wasn't enough to kill him, but every, every bone in his body was broken and his skin was like ripped off and thrown out of the road crash. But then he teleported to the hospital. <laughs> There's a moment in one of the task forces, and I don't remember which one it is off the top of my head, where the, the uh, Freedom Phalanx is gathered there, the Vindicators, the whole group, they're all there, and you walk past them and into that portal. And they just there. kind of sit there, and I, I kind of feel out I'm like, I kind of want to turn around, you guys are coming, right? <laughs> so, but, but at the same time, it's that feeling that I'm going to face this thing that those guys aren't. And it's just, yeah, we do that on purpose. <laughs> so that, that's what it was for me. Cool. So I think a lot of the little things uh, make our quick me feel epic. So some things like in Firebase Sulu, when you get the artists, when they're asking you for your signature. Um, so, um, so, so, so some of the dialogue, I, I think it's been down, down in recent issues where people no longer seem to care, hey, you're level 50, you just like saved, you know, all sorts of things. Um, but it also occurred to me that minor things like like if you have done every COT mission that, that Oro 
offers, you know, so, so you know you've done all that it involved in COT. And then you go in and you're returning the dagger to Kernos. Why wouldn't he just say, uh, yes, thank you for the you know, dagger. Um, thank you. Please, please leave. Um, instead, instead of trying this, this uh, basically, like, eventually people should know your reputation. And so do things where, where sometimes the villains, you know, or where the minions just turn on their boss and say, we'll kill him for you. Please do this. Yeah, Sean, can you put more tokens in the game? There has been a recurring theme in practically every statement giving up, coming up here. And I would like to, if I may, try to condense those statements down to three very special words. What makes me feel epic? Having a legacy. When I'm talking to, say, well, when I could talk to statesmen, and he could remember when I was a villain based on my past deeds, and, the, and what he would say would change from that, that made me know that my actions had weight to them. You know, going through the task forces, getting the accolades, collecting the badges, that's nice. You know, that's something I can show up. It's like, I was there. I did this. The Defender of Primal Earth badge. I was there when Tyrant attacked, and I pushed it back. I drew the line in the sand, and I said, no more. Also, by Posse's grace, changing Trina and Pocket D was pretty dang spiffy, too, so. <laughs> I think uh, that kind of stuff, John and I love doing that, and you know, it's the kind of like, oh, they did that. Did we make sure to give something to say that they did that? They did an awesome, cool. All right, well, we're gonna bring that up now, you know, and so it's, you know, it's something yeah, really cool. The, uh, we have to do a lot of pre-planning, to get that just right, and we, we started doing that a lot in Going Road because we had you know, three zones set up, and so we could have that churn rate of stuff you did in, in Nova Victoria started showing up in uh, Imperial City and Metropolis. But uh, generally, we'll rely on souvenir clues to kind of like key us into which arcs you've done. But if we want to get any more dried and granular than that, we need to really plan far ahead and put those tokens in before the other. Two small things that make me actually feel epic, one of which will probably be unexpected here. Having the NPCs on the street talking about what I have been doing yeah. always yeah. makes me feel like I have done something that is noteworthy. Even if it was just a newspaper mission, the mere fact that it's being talked about on the street in a small way across a vast level range, you don't have to be a 50 for this, makes you feel special and makes you feel happy. One of the missions which I uh, did, which I was not thinking would be epic, and when I finished it, I had that feeling, was the villain morality mission of my other selves. And that one wasn't epic simply because of the mechanics involved, the, the, the gimmicks that you were doing with that. It was the promise. The promise that that mission held. And when you get to the end of it and you're thinking, okay. That was one of the times when it was just a tip mission. And when I got done with it, I felt like I had really accomplished something, even though it was just an instance. That one had a lot of epic feel to it. I agree. Yeah, no, I had a lot of fun working with Sean Pittman, uh, hashing out some of the details of that definition uh, as he was writing it. Uh, as many others have said, uh, the epicness when playing a villain comes from essentially making the world a worse place. <laughs> if you had never been born, the world would be a far better place. Um, and one thing that I think many or all of us, primarily villain players, would like to do at some point is take over the world. To actually be able to do it. Even if it's only for a bit. But, if we go into space, I mean, we've got the battalion coming here, they're aliens. We know nothing about how space is out there. We don't know the equivalents of the Kree or the Skrulls, or if there's an Annihilation Wave or Green Lantern Corps, anything out there. Why couldn't we, as these massive incarnates, just take over a planet? 
We can take over the world, and it can stay taken over. We can just have it. It's, that's ours now. <laughs> I mean, we do. We, we permanently enslave Mortimer Cal. He's our... Oh, uh, he's our wacky. You think it's permanent. I do think it's permanent. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't see why we couldn't do the same with the planet. But, yeah, I have, I have an army. Then there's all the logistics, and you have to keep them fed, and there's wolves. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay, at the yeah. very least, taking it over would be pretty fun. Did the we space gave stallions a, show up? We gave, you a, we gave you a press conference at the end of the Signature Story. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's true. It was pretty awesome. I still would fully advocate, as a villain, being able to conquer an alien war. We're going to have that on the uh, schedule first. She said it. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, guys. So we're gonna take two more, uh, two more uh, examples with you guys of what makes you feel epic, and then we are going to start wrapping it up because it's uh, it's about that time. It's almost drink thirty. <laughs> <laughs> to break forth with the rhythm and the rhyme, and it's yes, it's almost drink thirty. So let's go right ahead, gentlemen. So for hero cycle, when it doesn't make me feel epic is when I go on a task force and think there's no way we're going to fail. We've got a team of X number, and that says we're going to win. Down, hand down, whatever. Uh, to go off of what Ernie was saying about uh, being the last line between, uh, between the uh, batteries and, uh, and the civilians, go ahead and make it mechanically impossible to stop them. Give us rewards based on how many people we save, not on actually stopping them. And if we actually stop them, that's when you give us the accolade or whatever. It, it, just playing the same thing and never getting beyond the last time I went on a mission is just not epic at all. So one of the things uh, that I delve into a lot is the psychology of reward. Um, and uh, you know, you say, don't give me the accolade until I, until I, you know, I, I, I reach the ultimate goal. To many players, that's the only goal, right? That's the psychology of the reward. It's like, you can reward them all the way up, and if they don't get that end thing, then they fail. Right? And you know, our, our players have shown, you know, with our data on the incarnate trials, if they fail, they don't like them. They, they, they want to do something, they want to do something that they can beat, right? So they tend to play the ones that they know and they know they can beat. They know they can overpower and, and, have, and have a thing, so. That's true, but on the other hand, there are, have been missions that people said before were unbeatable, that eventually everyone figured out a way to beat it. Yes. And, Exactly, but uh, you know they they tend to go to the you know where the path of least resistance is. So. Yeah, we've uh, on mission side we've, we've gotten less positive feedback on story arcs that have failed conditions on any of the missions, and therefore force you to start over or redo a mission. Um, so yeah, I mean you know we're taking the feedback that we get. Okay. Well, since everyone else has been mostly focusing on the story side, I want to actually come up and speak about the mechanic side. And there are two archetypes for me that I feel make me feel the most epic. And one of them is because of the most recent changes, which is the Stalkers. The newest the Assassin Strike really brings about the epic feel for the archetype. The other archetype, which at one point uh, contained 50% of my level 50 characters is a dominator. And I still remember back before um, inventions were put in, when we just had single origins. And I remember coming up to a room where there's three different spawns, and they would all aggro as soon as you moved in. I ended up using the domination, and since I was mind control dominator, I used mass confuse on one group, terrify on another, and then total domination on the third group, and we just went through it without a hiccup. <laughs> yeah, so I, re I remember the day when someone came to me and said, hey, players can get to permanent domination. Uh, is this something we want to allow them to do? And uh, I may regret saying yes, but uh, you know, I think it really made the dominators feel epic. So. I definitely agree with that. You kept, went for it and kept that in. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to the panelists. Well, folks, that is all she wrote.
can't believe I said folks. I actually promised myself after my last gig I would never say folks, actually. And, I know. Three times. As you may see, uh, as evidenced by uh, the, the beverages, the adult style beverages in front of some of our panelists, uh, it, the, uh, the hour is upon us for cocktails, uh, but before we do that, um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you uh, very much to all of you for coming today. Um, we really would not uh, would not be here without you. Uh, you guys, uh, the players, for the last you know over eight years now, uh, you know are what brings us here and what keeps us going and what keeps driving us. Can you describe us? Can't have a serious moment at all. <laughs> Whatever. We love you guys. So from uh, Paragon Studios to you guys, thank you and a round of applause for the play. And uh, I would really like to say thank you very much to all of the Paragon Studios staff who have uh, volunteered their time this weekend to come out. So thank you very much, everybody, and you know what? <laughs> I need another Mai Tai. Let's get started. Let's go, let's go have some coffee drinks, guys. Dinner is 7.30. Uh, I should uh, say thank you to Andy, too, for all the work today. Yeah. So awesome. Enjoy your cocktails, guys.